Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the October 26th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. We are in for a surprise tonight. For those of you who are joining us for the first time and are not familiar with the British Empire Study Group, we're, we are a bunch of philatelists, postal historians, collectors, and there's even non-collectors that are welcome here. I'd like to take a little moment to acknowledge the loss of a, a I guess I'm going to call her a dear friend because that's what she was. Uh, Debbie Friedman, we lost Debbie Friedman earlier this month, actually on uh, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, for those of you who have not met Debbie, Debbie was in a member of the New York Area Collectors Club and uh, several other groups. She really brought a lot of young philatelists and new philatelists into the hobby. So if we could, I'd like to just have a, a brief moment of silence for Debbie. And for those of you who are interested, her obituary will be online uh, soon. Just a, a few minutes of silence. Our next meeting will be on November 9th with Tony Ward. I still have to confirm with him, but I think he's good to go. And that's going to be a real treat. It's everything old is new again. It's personalized issues in New Zealand, which should be a really fun topic. So now, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to my wonderful co-host, Rob Lutens, to introduce George and start the discussion. Take it away, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Our presenter this evening is the esteemed George W. Holschauer, founder and president of the Colonial Stamp Company in Los Angeles, California, a company he started in 1975. George is a lifetime member of the American Philatelic Society, a member of the American Stamp Dealers Association, the Philatelic Traders Society of London, the National Philatelic Traders Society, the International Federation of Stamp Dealers Association, the National Stamp Dealers Association, as well as the Canadian Stamp Dealers Association. George has a wealth of knowledge and experience, and we're really fortunate that he could take time out of his busy schedule to be with us tonight. So without further ado, let's meet our presenter this evening, the one and only George Horschauer. Well, greetings and salutations. Good to have uh, you here, George. George, you've become an icon in the world of philately. How did well, you get started uh, in the hobby? My father, uh, Collecting is ingrained in the Holshauer family going back for more than 100 years. My father, Kurt Holshauer, uh, died a few years ago at 97, and uh, he grew up in Upper Silesia when it was before World War I. Uh, in 1915, he was 10 years old and going to uh, walking to school. And some German troops had marched some Russian POWs through the town and they were resting. One of them, one of the Russians had a faltering understanding of German and in, uh, in, engaged my father in a conversation. The upshot of which was father felt so bad that the guy was starving to death that he gave this Russian POW his, the lunch his mother had carefully made for him to take to school. If his mother had ever found out, she probably would have crucified him. <laughs> but having said that, the guy was somewhat overcome and couldn't imagine what he could do to reciprocate for what this young lad had just done for him. Yeah. So he, he reached around inside his pocket, pulled out four or five envelopes of Russian stamps on them uh, that he mail he'd received during his sojourn in the military, tore the Russian stamps off the envelopes and gave them to my father who joyfully said goodbye and marched off to school with his new prize, a pocket full of Russian stamps from 1915. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> it Isn't bit it? him right to the core. Eventually it bit his son, and eventually it bit his grandson. So uh, uh, we've been involved in philately for <laughs> more than 100 years, one way or another. Hmm. What, what encouraged you to transition? from being a collector to being in the trade? Well, occasionally uh, when I was in junior high school, uh, I ended up with some duplicates and there was a couple of kids in school that were that were collectors and I sold them some of my duplicates. Okay. And I said, gee, there's gold in them, there are hills. So 
<laughs> I did more and more and more of this. And um, uh, as an active collector, I ended up with, as everybody does, things they don't need. And uh, it, it transitioned. And eventually I said, you know, philately is wonderful. It's interesting. It's stimulating. It's challenging. It has, it offers everything I could possibly wish for. So uh, I said, you know, at the end of the day, this is really, this is really what I want to be doing because it's, and I haven't regretted it one day in all the years I've been doing this. It has been a great pleasure. Being of oh, help wonderful. to my clients is a joy. Can you tell us a little about Colonial Stamp Company? Well, um, I, my father collected Eastern and Western Europe for his lifetime. Uh, those are those collections I inherited. And I uh, had a Canada collection and a US collection, a few other things. Uh, father was a, a nice collector, but was not, certainly wasn't wealthy. But he collected for years and years and years and years. And I worked on some of those collections with him while he was still alive. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, from the initial stamp albums that I had as a kid, uh, I grew I grew them, and in, in 1957, I was the happiest camper in the world because I concluded what I was really interested in was early material from these places, and I felt there was more interesting stuff in British Africa than there was anywhere else in the empire. It had more unusual things that, that can't be equaled anywhere. The large concert mail stamp to Madagascar, the hand typewritten Uganda missionary stamps, the rare provisional overprints from British East Africa. Phenomenal stuff, very, very interesting and challenging and stimulating material. So I said, well, the empire is too big to deal with. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to focus on British Africa. So in 1957, being tired of pasting stamps around the margin of my albums because there wasn't any room for these things I was buying, I sprung for a set of Scott Specialty albums for British Africa <laughs> in 57. The first thing I did was open them up, take the pages of George VI and Queen Elizabeth and uh, put them in the drawer, close it up, mount the collection, and I was off to the races. And to this very day, I'm working on the same albums. They're just uh, somewhat more advanced than they were in 1957. Great. Um, do you handle just the British colonies or does an occasional foreign cover find its way into your shop? My job is to take care of the needs of my clients, whether it's a hundred dollar a month retiree or a, a giant of industry. It does, it, it's neither here nor there. They all need help of one sort and another. Uh, given that my father did Eastern and Western Europe, I had a, a very good understanding of that material and other areas. So I've dealt, uh, we deal with rare stamps of all countries, partially those which we collect for ourselves, but those countries are mostly finished. But, uh, Whatever area the client needs help with, it could be Brazil. It doesn't matter. Okay. My job is to assess where he's at, figure out what he needs, put a budget together, and let him go back to running his corporations and doing the things he wants to do. Because I have the joy of spending 100% of my time concerned with only what he needs. Mm -hmm. That is fun because I've always appreciated the fact no great collection has ever been formed in a vacuum. We all had a lot of help, depending on how, how seriously we took the question of building the collection. We had a lot of help in building it by people who knew more than we did at the time we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And the collections I formed for myself would never have reached these, these, uh, this level had I not had good input and great help from phenomenal dealers around the world that have been both my friends and people that I work with uh, right. on an ongoing basis. And it's very important to realize we have limitations, especially if we're not a professional trader. We can't spend all the time we need to, to put this together. We need help from other people who can, mm -hmm. but that's what they're paying us for, to take care of business, help them with what they're trying to do and pay attention to what they're trying to accomplish. And that's been a driving 
factor. And we deal in rare stamps. Of, I've sold Reunion 1 and 2 uh, within the last 18 months uh, of South America. Uh, rarities from Europe and Eastern Europe. And, and there's very few countries I haven't done something with because my clients need help. They need guidance and help in putting it together. And I like to feel that if I put my shoulder to the wheel, I can make a difference in the outcome of that collection. Okay. Because he wants help and I'm very happy to give it to him. So there is no country I won't attack. Okay. Now, I have to say Afghanistan and Transvaal are a holy nightmare. <laughs> I, I accept no no giant expertise in either the subject, even though I collect Transvaal with a vengeance. It's a miserable place and it's very hard to do. <laughs> but as far as most of the rest of us concerned, I will tackle it. <laughs> right. George, I know that Colonial holds auctions. Um, would you consider yourself more of a dealer or an auctioneer? Um, which do you prefer? I'm far more a private dealer than an auctioneer. Okay. Uh, okay. We get estates and properties all the time. I mean, we've been in business a great long while. Uh, we run two auctions a year, and that's it. Because I'm spending my days working on very specific projects for very specific clients. And that takes a lot of time. I travel all over the world. I've been in Europe twice this year. I just got back from London. Uh, I think nothing of going to Geneva or Zurich. Well, I do what is necessary to take care of those clients because mm -hmm. they came to me for help. I wish I could find somebody who would take my want list to do something with it, except I can't find anybody to do it, but I, 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 I would pay them handsomely. Of course, the meanest thing in the world I could do is give them this impossible list and send him out into the chicken fricassee to try and find some of this stuff. If I couldn't find it, he's got a Chinaman's chance, and you know what? <laughs> but so I, I try not to burden my my friendly dealers. I'll buy from them what they have that I need or that I'm interested in, and I'll leave it at that. But I don't want to give them lists that are so heartbreakingly and gut wrenchingly difficult that it it uh, it doesn't. It, you, it, you can't make a living trying to fill my want list because you can't find the material to make it happen. Right, right. You've got really top rated material and you seem to be very picky about the stamps you sell. Is this by design? Yeah, how about if I don't, if it ain't good enough to go in my stamp collection, it isn't good enough to go to my client. How about them apples? It's a good ruler. Good material holds its 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 commercial potential for as long as you need to have it when when it's there i when i take that stamp out even if it's five years later and pull it out of the vault it's just as nice a stamp as i put in there in the first place so it didn't matter that it was sitting there until with a, an appropriate client turned up when i hauled it out it was a real nice stamp mm -hmm. and uh, uh i love great quality i love great condition I collect great condition. I'm willing to pay for it right through the schnout. But I want nice material. And I want my clients to have nice material. I mean, it's it's uh, whether I'm working on my collection or their collection, it doesn't matter. It's the same. The, the rules are the same. <clears throat> if I'm not happy to live with it, I don't want to know about it. Let somebody else sell it to their clients. I don't want to touch it with a barge pole. Mm -hmm. I want nice material so that whenever they sit down, that they're going to say, well, it isn't inexpensive, but gee whiz, what a nice stamp. Well, darn, what you, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was done. That was done with malice aforethought. <laughs> I love great material, love great material, whether mine or the clients, it doesn't matter. I have fun with it. I understand you actually help your clients to build their collections. Do you have any advice on how to collect? Yeah, this is this is this is something worth thinking about. As I said earlier on, no great collection was formed in a vacuum. There were a lot of dealers and auctioneers around the world that that uh, provided material in the formation of that thing. And uh, it's it's a it's important to develop a relationship with those dealers capable 
and sufficiently intelligent enough to understand the nature of what you're trying to achieve. If you find that guy, win, lose, or draw, whoever it is, he can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Bob Lyman sold me some of the most fantastic things I've ever seen in a lifetime 50 years ago. I admit, he's long dead, but I'm, I'm eternally grateful for the phenomenal rarities he sold me. And he gave me terms to pay for some of it because some of it was, <laughs> was not exactly inexpensive, but that's all right, it didn't matter. Um, as a collection, let's assume we're all talking about the same country, my wonderful, mythological country called inner outer zuzu land now let's assume you you got you you got the bug to do inner outer zuzu land 50 years ago 30 years ago 20 years whatever and you finally broke down and bought your bought your, your album for zuzu land and you mounted your your nascent collection of zuzu land into this book so what's the next thing you do? Well, you took a roll of toilet paper <laughs> and you wrote down all the Scott numbers or the Michel numbers or the Gibbons numbers of the things that you needed to finish your Zuzuland collection. After five or 10 or 15 years, you're gonna have all the stuff of, of uh, uh, pretty well of no consequence or of modest consequence. You're gonna get the list, the list is gonna get smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. but by the same time, it's gonna get harder and harder. The further along you get with Zuzuland, eventually you get to a point where you're having problems because, yeah, it's, there there is no substitute for the experience of doing it. Catalogs are wonderful, provided that the editor actually collected the country. If he collected the country for twenty years, I'd be very happy to hear what he has to say about it. But he better have collected it a long time and understand what he's doing because otherwise. Why did I bid thirty thousand mm. dollars two years ago on a stamp for one of my collections that I could not find to save my life? Mm. Came up, came up four thousand five hundred dollars. I said, "You, there it is." And by God, I've been trying to buy that damn thing forever. So I gave the penguin, my agent, thirty thousand dollars. I said, "Bring me the stamp and some change." This wasn't a trick question. It wasn't something other than what they said it was. It was no more, no less than what they said it was. And the condition was fine to very fine. There was nothing fantastic about it. And I will not reveal what it is, but that's neither here nor there. The story is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 4,500. I said, I am, so, I am so sick and tired of chasing this thing all over the world. Uh, so I gave... I gave uh, Mandel, the famous penguin agent and dear friend, a thirty thousand dollar bid and said, "Bring me the stamp and some change." So I call him on Monday and I said, "How much did you save me?" He said, "Nothing." I said, "What do you mean you didn't save me?" He said, "You didn't buy it." I said, "What do you mean I didn't buy it?" He said, "Somebody sat on the phone and ran me from a thousand the 32 and a half thousand, in which case I had to put my hand down. I said, that is the right thing. Let's say I'm still sitting in Scott at 4,000. Still sitting in Gibbons at 4,500, same price it did, did uh, two years ago. Look, you can't, it's not possible. It's not, it's difficult for editors to try and stay on top of everything that's happening. And I understand that. But I think it surely helps if they collected an area long enough to understand what made it tick. Mm -hmm. We're talking about your GB shilling greens. You can sit there and talk to me about that for an hour extemporaneously because you spent the years chasing the stuff down. You know what you haven't been able to find. You know, you know, you have a feel for having done the work. You do the work, you get an understanding. And that is what dealers can most usefully impart to their clients they don't have to spend 50 years to do it they can say hey gh what do you think about this that's like putting a, a nickel in the slot and pulling the machine and i'll talk to them about it because i will disgorge my experiences over many 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 decades um what was the question again <laughs> 
did you have any advice on how to collect? Yes, how to collect. Yeah. Develop. Realize that that the collection is not going to be put together. You can you can do all you want, but you but you can use as much help as you can get in forming this. So you need to work with dealers here or in Europe or I don't care who they are or where they are that have a predereliction towards the same material because they will have a personal interest in this, not just it's such and such a number. I can't do that for South America. I can't do that for many other countries. But if you talk about British Africa, now there's another there's a horse of a different feather. Mm -hmm. That I can talk about ad nauseum. You need it, it's important to the development of a collection. And this has nothing to do with how big your budget is. I've got a retiree who spends $100 a month with me. And every every January, I send him $1,200 worth of stampies. And once a month comes in a check, going for $100. Now, <laughs> because I, he's a sweet guy. And he this is, this is all he can afford. And I love to do it because it's making him happy. And he's able to continue to collect. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a thing I do because it makes me, it makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. There are other things I'm working on for many, many millions of dollars, <laughs> which make up the difference. So it all it all spells mother when you're through with it. Mm -hmm. They, I couldn't have put together the collections without the help of a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. As your inner outer Zuzuland collection becomes more and more complete, not quite complete, but more and more complete. You're you're basically working your down to the to the to the nubbins where things get really really difficult. You need to be able to tap into people who who have some facility with the country involved, with the area involved, and can talk intelligently about what they're dealing with here, not somebody who doesn't know a damn thing about an or Zuzu land. Well, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know a damn thing about early Afghanistan. Or Shanghai Dragons, for that matter. Uh, complicated areas I've never tackled. But I had groups of people who were very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Because they were handling estates and properties I was not handling. And material came their way of great interest to me. And after having me as a client for 20 or 30 years and knowing my capacity that I'm interested in building this collection, I'm not here to fool around. <clears throat> when something came along, such as the large concert mail stamps of Madagascar, for which I'm infamously famous, <laughs> I love them passionately. <laughs> anyway, there's a there's a target on my back, but they all know that this is this is areas of interest. And if something special comes along, it is imperative for the customer. Collecting with his little album of inner Zuzu land, it is imperative that the dealer call him first when there's something there. Mm -hmm. Because num being called two, three, four, five, or not at all doesn't help him. Mm -hmm. He's cut himself off from people who could have been of enormous help to them. But he said, Oh, the price is too much, and this I don't like, and I don't like this and that, and then I can buy it cheaper elsewhere. I thought, wonderful. Go over, go, go over to the internet and spend the rest of your life having a wonderful time on the internet. Mm -hmm. But when the important stuff comes along, you need to go to the people who actually put their money where their mouth is and take care of these things and venerate these things with or without the customer. We have tens of millions of dollars worth of stamps sitting around with no specific client. Doesn't matter. They're great, great material. When someone comes along who needs it, he's got to be very glad I spent the money and time and effort to build and maintain that stock just so he can sit down and spend $1,218.54 for a few stamps that he wanted. But he's going to say, Jesus, I couldn't find that anywhere. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Like you say, I mean, once you've gathered up all the low hanging fruit, then you're going to need a specialist. It's it. It's very important. If I got called second, 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 uh, second string or third string or worse yet, all so many wonderful things would never have come my way. 
what you do, <laughs> I'll tell you a real secret, kiddies. <laughs> pay, pay attention to this. You endear yourself to the dealers that you work with. <laughs> you make them so happy to have you as a client. Now, how do you do that? not by oh it's way too expensive and it's more than catalog and i saw it cheaper on ebay whatever that's irrelevant the guy you're dealing with has put his money far more money into it than you're ever going to spend and more more likely than not the bottom bottom is you want him to remember your and take a personal interest in what you're trying to do mm -hmm. And that is not the easiest thing to do, as you will find out if you try to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, you do two things. You inquire about the price. You like the piece, you want the piece. It's a little more than you want to spend, but it's very nice. And, I, and you know from your own experience with the Zuzu land, that that's not an easy stand. Mm -hmm. So you pat the guy on the head <laughs> and you whip out your checkbook or you say, this is too much. Can we do a hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month on this big stamp? Well, if you build up, if you build up a right kind of rapport, of course you can. Point in fact, I was doing a show in, in New York, Madison Square Garden, no, oh, 30 years ago. And next to me was a friend of mine, a dealer from Switzerland. And he had under his table a very nice used 12 penny black of Canada. Stamp you're familiar with. It. Very nice. And uh it was uh, I don't know, fifty-five thousand dollars, which was a lot of a huge amount of money at me at that time. So I said to my pal, I said, I got good news and bad news, which do you want first? <laughs> I said, what do you have? What do you need to have for this? He said, from you, I'll take 50 grand. I said, that's the that's the good news. I'll buy it and I'll give you 50 grand. And then he starts getting suspicious. Like, What's the bad news? I said, hang on. I took out my checkbook and I tore out 10 checks. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote down five thousand dollars a piece on them and handed him fifty thousand dollars. Now I guarantee you that was almost certainly the biggest sale he made at the stamp show by a long shot but that stamp is in my canadian collection to this day and i'm very happy i have it and so i ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for months paying for it so what i'm here to tell the tale and i still got the stamp and i own it which is even better so it's you got to do some mix and matching in your building of your collection and if you have the right rapport with the dealer, you'll be a happy, he'll make you a happy camper. Mm -hmm. Aggravate him and he will drop you off a cliff and say, have a wonderful life. I really don't need this aggravation. Mm -hmm. Honest to God, I don't. Mm -hmm. But there's the door. Have a wonderful life. But I this I this kind of grief I, I'm not interested in doing. But you see, it points out, I you know, I don't know if I'd had that stamp today if it hadn't been for the kindness <laughs> of a friendly dealer whom I had a wonderful rapport with. And it got something done I wanted to do, and it got it done in a way that, that made a certain amount of sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, my accountant would have killed me if I had written a check for 50,000 in 1982 <laughs> to, to buy something that was going into quote, the corporate reference collection, <laughs> but it worked. No man is an island. These collections are not going to be put together all by yourself. I don't care how smart you are and how much you know about it. The fact of the matter is we all need serious help from people who know what they, what the blue blazes they're doing and have, a, as the Germans say, a verständnis, an understanding of the subject. They can be of enormous help to you. And there's a bunch of them out there that are really great people that are fine, fine philatelists. Check it out. Your collections will always benefit from it. So how do you collect? Look, we all love a bar. God knows we all do. 
time to buy a great stamp that's misidentified or that's a bad day in the auction, which happens from time to time. It's wonderful. But you cannot build a real meaningful collection of inner outer Zuzuland on the three or four things that you absolutely swipe for about four cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Because there's other things that will come back and bite you. And when you try to tackle those, you're going to you're going to find that you're not the only one. Surprise, surprise. You're not the only man in the world who took a shine to inner outer Zuzuland. Hmm. I mean, I'm having this problem right now in a very serious way because I'm down to things that I really want that are six, significant six and seven figure stamps. Well, I mean, I can only handle a certain amount of that. I'm not a billionaire. And I am up against some people who have more money than God. And when I lost the $4,000 stamp at 30,000, somebody just ran me out and said, I want this stamp. I can't find it. I know the catalog is smoking a controlled substance. Well, I have to say he was right. That's the reason why I bid $30,000 on a $4,000 stand, because I had no faith in the, in the underlying price. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this guy proved me right by taking it away from me. <laughs> but that's all right. We live and learn. We need to understand how the pieces of our Zuzuland collection interreact with one another. Mm -hmm. There are certain expensive stamps from inner outer Zuzuland that you have seen ad nauseum. And there's stamps from inner outer Zuzuland that catalog a tenth of that, and you've never seen a copy of it. Mm -hmm. You're still looking for the first copy. So it's it's mix and match. That's why one benefits by working with dealers who are coming. I'm coming back from where this guy's trying to get to, so I can help him understand what his problems are even better than he did before. Because I've also he's not the first guy I tried to help build inner outer Zuzuland. I've done mm -hmm. it many times. So I, I certainly know what money can't do for us. Mm -hmm. And that's also very, 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 very interesting. There is material that in practice is, is somewhat more difficult than it appears. And there's expensive things that are more than amply cataloged. Uh, so the only way you can differentiate the two is spend 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years fooling with it so you get an understanding yourself and the nice thing about that is if you will spend if one will spend the time and make the effort two guys who never met before are having lunch in london at their club they both do in or out or zuzu land they've never met before they both collected the 10 20 30 40 years and suddenly they start talking and they both come up with the same conclusion. You know that 27B. Oh, Jesus, don't talk about the 27B. You, you got to be kidding. Well, they can't help it because the truth of the matter will out. If they do it, they will both come to the same conclusion. They have to. They have no other choice. Either that or I have not been a very good observer of the a marketplace, and that's no one can accuse me of that. It's 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 fun to build a collection and you can use as much skilled help as you can get and there are lots of people out there that can give you a hand but, oh, but at least go with somebody who knows something about her in our in our outer Zuzuland. george aside from the uh the business reference collection do you have any personal collections mm, not much mm -hmm. most it's most it's reference it's either the reference or or working on collections my father started Mm hmm but uh it's over 100 volumes and uh it's i'm fascinated but i love a challenge whether i'm doing it for one of my pals or i'm doing it for myself i get the same bang out of it it's 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 addressing the question and seeing what you can do to put that in perspective and make it work uh -huh. and as i said uh i need all the help i can get this stuff is it was so easy i would have done it years ago the problem is i'm still looking i'm still looking for it it's a it's a it's a minor uh, minor piece of misery and the clients have the same problems with their collections if they do it long enough as you said the little, the little hanging free falls off the tree 
And then they start to then they start to get to some stuff that isn't funny. George, do you have a favorite stamp or cover that got away? <laughs> a number of them. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you a quick a quick tale. Um I have a thing for uh, German colonies and the British occupation of former German colonies. And I have a formidable collection of that area, which I've done in 60 years. And I've gotten Togo, um, the British part of Togo, down to two major numbers. They are both unique. Uh, there's one each of these two in the Royal Collection, and this this other pair, which which is uh, which is. Uh, still in the market it's still in the marketplace and they were at a cornfield of sale in the early 70s and they brought oh jesus i think one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. well i <laughs> i didn't own one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in 1972 by any stretch of the imagination instant bankruptcy i mean i lusted after them because they were the only two major stamps in the british section that i didn't have even way back 50 years ago mm. So I just I went to the sales and to some other stuff, but I couldn't I couldn't touch it with a barge pole. And a couple, ooh, ah, three, four, three, four years ago now, um, a German auction, uh, a German auctioneer uh, uh, from Curlers um, came over to my table. I talk about having a, a target on your back. <laughs> See, he comes by. We got something coming up that might be of interest to you, and he puts them down on the table. And there they are, the same two stamps from the cornfield sale of '72. And I said, yeah, "Well, you're right. I do have a passing interest in this pair of stamps." <laughs> Called, I'd sell my soul. Yeah. So it wasn't coming up for a year. So I put a little war chest together stuff, and I even sold some excess inventory. I wanted to build up a war chest because this was going to be a frightful, frightful undertaking. So I put together $300,000, not knowing what was going to happen. Um, and so I went to the sale. So the thing, the pair opens the two. The thing opens for I don't know, one hundred and thirty thousand. And there's a little for fluffle on the floor, and two or three people play a little. Anyway, about about one hundred and sixty thousand. The floors at it. So then I started to bid, and there was a guy on the phone, and we took it from one hundred and sixty thousand. To three hundred and fifty thousand, at which point I had to take my hand out because I had to response in my capacity. Hmm. It was the most expensive thing I ever, I ever personally tried to wire, and I'm still sad that I wasn't able to do it. Well, wow. uh, I applaud the man who had the uh, hmm, intestinal fortitude <laughs> to take it to four hundred thousand dollars. I don't think he was wrong. I think he was right, but I wasn't a billionaire. If I had a billionaire, there would have been a lot more Morton Totschlag. That thing would have hit a million dollars if money hadn't meant anything to me. What what stamps were those, George? They were the three and five mark Togo, uh, German Togo overprints for the British occupation. Oh, yeah. Uh, two of each. It was a fascinating story. Um, there was a pair of three three marks overprinted and a pair of five marks overprinted, mm -hmm. and the British officers knew it, but there was only two, and there was a, a lottery, and an officer, British officer, won the lottery with the right to buy for peanuts, the the pair of the three and the pair of the five. To authenticate them, he took them to the post office in Lome, in Togo, and had the pair canceled. He split the pair and sent one three mark and one five mark to King George V of the Royal Collection. 
And anybody who has that big, wonderful Morocco bound mm -hmm. sweetheart of a book showing you <laughs> what the British collection looked like in 1950. If you trundle away through there, you will find a picture of them. Well, they're the only mm. other, the only other two, the uh, only earth, there are only one each of the others. And, uh, uh, but as you work on in and out of Zuzuland, you will, you will start attracting more. The higher up you go, the more serious your competition is going to become. The only thing that will save your bacon is to understand that thirty thousand dollars was in that instant not too much to bid for the stamps that cattle for. Why? Because Holshar was a fool. Holshar didn't know what he was doing. Holshar lost lost uh, lost his his marbles. No, because somebody else lost even more marbles than he did. It proved to people who understood the issue involved. It mm -hmm. proved conclusively that both of us knew exactly what we were doing. He just had a little more oomph than I did. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Do, oh. do you have any? Do you have any specific advice for uh, those who are collecting British Empire? Yeah, um, try not to. Try not to. Um, a couple of things. I maintain rightly or wrongly, and I mean, if you're a billionaire, this doesn't hold true. You got one good collection. In you, whatever it is, general commonwealth, uh, specific commonwealth, specific colonies, other countries. Pick your target and stay with it. I collect today the same things I collected in 1952. They're much better collections. It takes a lifetime of devoted interest and, and effort to say nothing of money. To put a put a great collection together of inner outer zuzu land mm -hmm. and you just grant the list gets smaller but the stuff becomes more challenging and you simply hang in there and keep hammering away at it mm -hmm. so they one by one by one by one they fall you need determination and connections mm -hmm. these are two things that are really important percentage Percentage as a catalog means nothing to me. Estimates as an auction mean nothing to me. What does the stamp mean to me based on a lifetime of experience with that particular issue? That's what means something to me. The rest of that means nothing. Because occasionally uh, I've had a conversation that a guy said, well, uh, inner outer Zuzuland 27. Well, I was up in the in the Feffel Finger auction and it only made five hundred dollars, which was cheap. Yes, but prices realized only tell you about the tinsel weakness and strength of the underbidder. It tells you nothing about what I was prepared to pay for that stamp. It tells you that that's what it hammered down for on that day. It was either a very big price or very little price or something in the middle. But you and I are not privileged to know what the winner was actually prepared to do. I have bought things at a tenth of my bid. I had a bid of $10,000 on a lot estimated at 50, 50 pounds. Never mind what it was, it's the truth. I said, I went, I, I flew halfway around the world to buy it because it was a fantastic stamp and I don't wish to re reveal what it is that's irrelevant. Having said that, I sat there and I said, boy, when that thing comes up, the walls are gonna crumble. I'm gonna get buried alive. And they open it up at 50 foot. I'm holding my breath. Down. The auctioneer looks at me and hammers it down. Hmm. George, are you familiar here. with any? Here's a listing, and here's what it brought. Nothing. What? 10,000 would not have stopped me. 
So we have to, again, we need to rely as much on our own experience with the material as so-called prices realize. They're great. The only time I learn anything at all about the value of a stamp is when it brings two or three times what I thought it could possibly bring. That tells me something. That it was a, the, the, there was a, the bad day at Black Rock told me not. <laughs> I'm sorry, go. George, are you familiar with any collecting areas that are just landmines? <laughs> yeah, I can think of two of them. <laughs> Transvaal is arguably one of the most difficult countries to sort out in the world. I'm reasonable, but certainly not brilliant at it. It's It has been a, a nightmare uh, of reprints and different printings and things. It is a very... Very, there's some, there are a couple of deal. There's a couple of collectors in the Netherlands who are absolutely spectacular collectors of this stuff. Uh, I've seen some of the collections, they are absolutely mind boggling, but I find it very difficult. Uh, a very difficult, it's the hardest country I, I work with on an ongoing basis, other than what other people ask me to take care of, in which case I will do it. Very difficult. Drickerland is another one, the over the G overprints from Drickerland. Oh, they could be so exasperating because they are so close to one another. I do not feel that I have any great confidence in either one of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, landmines, up oh, plenty. Oh, plenty. Most of the other things are doable. Those two, I, I find uh, a, a gigantic misery. I lean on a lot of pals of mine who know much more about it than I do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> how do you think? Uh, how do you think that dealers and collectors can together help to uh, build the hobby by sharing their enthusiasm? Mm -hmm. I am as enthusiastic today as I was in 1952. I am my first miserable stampede. I love the thing, I love the clients, I love the work. The challenge is enormous, it is fun. The collector gets fun chasing the stuff. The dealer has fun chasing the stuff on behalf of the client. And occasionally he does, he collects a few things of his own just for the fun of it. Right. Um, I think enthusiasm, if you really love what you're doing, it, 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 as a collector, it, 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 it bubbles over. Mm -hmm. I mean, today you've talk, I've been talking and you could see that the, the coach was really quite thrilled about what he was doing and I was having a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's true. Well, that's why. Why shouldn't we all do that? This is supposed to be a hobby, something that, we, that gives us fun and pleasure, a chance to learn, a chance to hone our skills, a chance to accomplish something. It has all the earmarks of a wonderful hobby as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I think both dealers being legitimately enthusiastic about the work, I think spills over. My enthusiasm has created some wonderful clients because they too said, oh, that is interesting. Off they went to the, uh, the late, the, <laughs> uh, uh, it was a, a televangelist out here in Los Angeles. <laughs> Never met a stamp he didn't like. <laughs> and uh, we came into the office one day, and, and I, was, uh, I was working on my Uganda missionary collection. And suddenly the light bulb went on. I said, hey, Gene, come over here. <laughs> Take a look at this. These were, these were typed by a missionary in Uganda. Well, that was all it took, and he went to form a gigantic collection of Uganda missionaries. That's because it related to his yeah. espoused. Uh, okay, George, I got, I've got a tough question for you. Sure. Why inner outer Suzuland, Zuzuland, and not Zululand? Because then you'd know what I was talking about. <laughs> 
in or out of Zuzu land, you have no clue. Because <laughs> there isn't a, well, it's more fun, to me, it's more fun to have a mythological country <laughs> that we of can course. all laugh about and have fun with. And after all, philately is fun. It's a joyous thing. It brings us enormous enjoyment and opportunities to study and learn and work. And there's also the relationships, the relationships mm -hmm. I have with thousands of people all over the world that are just, some of my dearest friends are my client. After 50 years, I cannot tell the difference between the clients and the customers. There is no difference. <laughs> it's all a homogenous whole. I love that we have fun together. We do a certain amount of business. It's great. And I enjoy being part of, I get really, I hate, to, I hate to admit this, I get terribly wound up in some of these more serious collections that are, that are being formed today, here, both here and in Europe. And I like to feel that I can make a difference and I can make it, I can, I can contribute. I have something to contribute to that collection. And and I know they're happy. They're happy as a clam. When I say, oh, by the way, you remember that uh, in or out of Zuzuland 27B we were schmoozing about? <laughs> Get out your checkbook. <laughs> oh, that's so much fun. I can't stand it. It's, 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 it's joy personified. And it has nothing to do with the money. It's important, but it's not, it's not the end all and be all of this. Getting accomplishing something to me is the great, the great joy of philately. And as I said before, these things are not put together in a vacuum. George, before we open up the floor to the audience for Q and A, is there is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I thank you. <laughs> uh, not not particularly. I, the only thing I will say is that. Uh, uh, before we open this up, I, I will not identify any of the stamps referred to in this in the previous conversation as uh, they are proprietary. Other than that, ask away. <laughs> okay, we've we've got a couple questions that have been posted while while you've been nope. speaking. Um, Philip Visser is asking: Is the tradition continuing with your family? Yes. Oh yes, my son is. In the, I'm sorry. Um, my son, Kevin, has been in yeah. the business now with me for three or four years. He came out of private industry and he's progressing very nicely. He's got a lot of his father's attributes, which is, pleases me no end. And I think anybody with a business, big or small, that put their heart and soul into building something from nothing, the, the very thought that it might successfully pass on to the next generation. Uh, I was just commenting that to my son this afternoon, telling him how happy I was. That, that, the, that all the work I put into building this business from scratch will proceed on to another generation. And he's <laughs> very quick. He will make a very, very good, he'll make a very good stamp fed with a dealer in his own right. Well, we need to thank Kevin in his own right for helping us tonight too with your, your presentation. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, hang on for a second. Kevin! There we go. Hang on for a second. This is the future Colonial Stamp Company. <laughs> oh. Hi, folks. I'm George, and this is my son, Kevin, who is the next generation of the company and the proud father he is of his son. Great Anyone to see you there, Kevin. Uh, no, I don't want to put you on a spot. But <laughs> well, I hope you're enjoying the the. The meeting and he's a wealth of information and you should be hanging on his every every word oh bless you <laughs> well anyway it's nice to have a father i tell you it's beyond nice to have a father and son business gosh oh, oh yes after putting all this in there and, and building a foundation uh and kevin is quicker than a he is very fast very good and he has he has some skill levels that I have never never even remotely <laughs> learned of. So together we're work, I think we're working nicely. To, I think we're working nicely together, comfortably and happily together. And excellent, excellent. Um, Sabina Singh 
Does your family still have the Russian stamps from 1915? Nice question. I I never saw and I have I made a I made a vow when father died at 97. I said no matter whatever else I may do in honor of my father I will complete I will attempt to complete every country that he started. Mm -hmm. You got to have some kind of a basis. It could be Michel, it could be Scott, it could be Iver. I said, we're going to make it Michel. We're going to make, we're going to make it Scott. So there's 8,000 numbers in Russia from number, Russia number one to the back of the book. Yeah. And, and uh, we had a reasonable representation, but we now have 8,000 different stamps in the country that the collection's complete. Took a while. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of money, but there it is. So Austria is finished, Germany is finished, France is finished, Belgium is finished, Switzerland is finished, Liechtenstein is finished. All the principal major numbers in the catalog are there. Uh, it's a challenge. It's something to build. I think when I was a kid, I first espoused the thought that I'd like to be an architect because I enjoyed building blocks and building things. Mm -hmm. And I'm still mesmerized by building things whether it's our collections our reference stuff the client stuff love it mm -hmm. to build something to put it together and i've got in the vault some a book full of colored pages of things that we completed that i'm very proud of they haven't been done by many people in the 20th century but uh, we have two pages of Turks Island, which is a nightmare of rarities. Mm -hmm. Every stock number is there. The first two issues of Fiji, the so-called Fiji Times Express, uh, had a wonderful client uh, uh, who had a passion for Fiji, and he was willing to back it with his own money. Mm -hmm. and. I worked 20 years on it and I finished the plating of the first and second issues. And I have a photograph of these completed reconstructions, which I don't mm. think have been done more than once or twice in the 20th century by anybody. But he appreciated it. Right. And so when you know, <laughs> worst thing you can do is encourage me because I work twice as hard because it's fun. And and something nice comes out of it at the end of the day and, and the money is the money is the money which is neither here nor there but to achieve things I, i'm i'm very very motivated by it uh, as far as the russian stamps are concerned i have i can imagine that they were uh, a coat of arms stamps of the period there's nothing in 1915 there's very little of any substance mm -hmm. in, in russia they're, they're pennies mm -hmm. they're penny stamps yeah, I know the material from that period. Uh, so they were no, I mean, they probably were today, they're probably worth a nickel piece. I don't know what they were, but I inherited his, they were in the collection somewhere when I, when I took it over. Uh, right. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what they were, but uh, if you look at Scott, you'll see there's virtually nothing of any substance uh, in that, in that area. There are some very scarce Russian stamps. Of course. Yeah. But, um, uh, I, 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 I wish I could identify them, but I couldn't. Um, Jason Brosma is asking, in the frame of what's been discussed today, do you believe there's any significant fundamental differences in how to put together a postal history cover collection versus a stamp collection? They have something in common because I am both a stamp collector and to a certain extent, a major postmark collector and postal history collector. Uh, I do much more with stamps than I do with postal history, but I've got a 15 volume collection of the village postmarks of the former German colonies and offices with a page for every post office that they ever had mm -hmm. and every sub type of every postmark they had. And I have been working on it for years and years and years and years and years. And it's a major, major collection. 
the bottom line is it, it, they're, they have something in com very much in common, and that is that you still have to collect German East Africa postmarks for a while to figure out which are the expensive ones that show up too frequently and which mm. are the cheaper ones which hardly ever seem to show up. I had German East Africa postmarks down to two. Very, very difficult things. And I finally plunged. I paid five, ten thousand dollars a piece for them, but I finished it. So it's we need to develop a feel for the things we're trying to build. And uh that can be that can be assisted greatly by dealers who've had more experience in the field than, than, than you have because they can point out before you even know you have a problem. That bring up that bring up a story that I did in the in the exposure I had in the in the article. The 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 client a client of mine comes up to the table in, in Monte Carlo. Nice guy, wonderful, wonderful. Hmm. Sits down, he buys a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm piling it up and adding it up. And he says to me, uh, "Oh, you know, I need one stamp from British Somaliland." So I shot back immediately. Don't tell me what it is. And I will not tell you what it is, but that's not the point. All right, George, we're going to start bringing people over now for a Q&A. OK, well, anyway, I, I, I ripped it out of the page, put it down there and said, give me fifteen hundred dollars. He looked it up. He said, yes, that's the one I needed. I said, guess what? How many times in the past have I had this problem? Because the catalog is out to lunch. It's too cheap. Anyway, please, uh, what else can I say? Are you going to bring some people over? Fine. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any questions showing up from the audience? Uh, use the raise hand button. I did notice a question before, George, about North Borneo being a collecting area. Yeah. Are you familiar with it? <laughs> is the Pope from Argentina. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yes, I'm familiar with all the major numbers of North Borneo, including several copies of number 54, which is the principal stamp of North Borneo, which I've had with Victoria. Yeah, it's it's a pro it's a bit of a problem child, especially in the 19th century, because an enormous amount of stuff was canceled to order with these. Try to find it with with the village cancellations is a lot more challenging than than cancel the order. Oh yeah, they 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 just rendered vast numbers of these things uh, with with cancel. Anyway, the, what was the question about North Borneo? Am I familiar? It was, it was a vague question. It was just uh, alluding. Oh, yeah, to sure. I'm familiar with all the major numbers. The number fifty four is the best one. <laughs> all right. It's a six set green overprint. Which I said they sold in London last year. <laughs> okay, Paul Holland, you you've got your hand up. Uh, <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> I was going to ask George. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, yeah, it's nice to see you, sir. <clears throat> I was I was going to ask you if uh, if you've got anything to say about uh, Sydney views. I've never done. I've never collected the. I mean, I have many. <laughs> Australian state collectors. And I think that the Sydney Views are some of the nicest classics in all of the Australian state. If I want to collect them, it's Sydney Views I collect. I think they're very, very handsome stamps. I think they're interesting. Uh, and uh, they offer all sorts of intriguing varieties or can and cancellations. I particularly like the Sydney, I don't collect them, but I love the Sydney Views with the, with the uh, Victoria cancel, the butterfly. The butterfly cancel on the on the on the on the Sydney views, I think, are charming. I really find them very, very interesting. Yeah, well, I, I find them really entrancing, and I've been getting into plating them and that sort of thing. So well, that's kind of fun too. I mean, fortunately, you've got a lot of people that have, that have attacked this over the last hundred years, so there must be some really good plating. I would think some good plating information. Oh yeah, there is. Yeah, I it's think, the plating is not. I, I think I like them. I think they're very handsome stamps. But I absolutely love the butterfly cancels on those. Every time I see one in a sale, I, I'd stop and look at it because it's, it's I, for me a very appealing thing. It's it's a very nice cancellation from one state, 
being used in, in New South Wales. Sydney views, I think they're handsome, handsome stamps. I like them a lot better than the early Victoria, which drives me crazy trying to classify. <laughs> oh, terrible. <laughs> a real pain in the you know what. <laughs> yeah, the Victoria doesn't appeal to me. The Sydney views oh, are. The uh, Sydney views, I think, are, are, are head and shoulders. <laughs> now I'll probably hear from some of my Victoria clients that beat, beat on me because I didn't love them, but I, I like the Sydney views a great deal. Uh, I applaud what you're doing. That, that, that's a fun, and plating is fun because the, the problem, which I find every once in a while, is the cancellation can be so heavy, it's hard to see whether there is a bail there or no bail. But I can't yeah. see through the case yeah, to see whether, thing is whether, it has a, whether it has a missing bail or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the key thing is finding lightly canceled ones. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, you can figure I think, out uh, I'm who's doing what castle that turned them obliterations. Yeah, no, I, think I, I agree with that. I think they're very handsome, Stan. But I, I've been up to my keister in, in British Africa for 70 some odd years. <laughs> so I got to save that for another 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 time. But I do like them. I, li I think they're very nicely executed stamps. So. Well, I, I have a service you. announcement. If anyone is still in the audience and wants to be brought over, please raise your hand because I think I brought everyone over who wanted to come over. Uh, there's one. And um, Robert, I think there's a, Tony has a question in the chat. Yeah. George, when, when you're looking for rare material for a client, are you willing to compromise on quality if that's all that's available? Depends on my experience with the material. Okay. If it is the first time I've seen the stamp in 50 years, I don't care what's been repaired, it doesn't matter. Uh-huh. Uh, it, 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 it's important to understand how that stamp fits into the configuration of all your experience with da 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 da, -da in our outer Zuzuland. Because then you get to you get to, this is the this is the first time I've ever seen this <clears throat> thing, or or God I've seen a dozen of them or I've handled a dozen of them. It's a question of of investing ourselves in learning about how the material from Inarado Zuzuland fits into each other and as part of the homogenous whole of the collecting of the country. Right. George. Yes. Tony Shields from Melbourne, Australia. Jesus Christ, how are you? I'm very oh, well. How are please. you? <laughs> You're keeping me from opening my shop, mate, because I thought I've got to listen to this talk. A man of extraordinary knowledge and experience. Well, bless your heart. Oh, that's so nice to hear from you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you something, which is a bit of a curious question. Um, I, I did a show in Denmark some years ago, and an American lady came up and asked me for Sydney Views. And I said, oh, so you're a specialist collector on Sydney Views, are you? And she said, no, I collect honeybees. And on the Sydney View, there is a tiny little beehive. <laughs> now, the curious thing about that is, of course, that she was a thematic collector, and she was collecting something on a totally different basis from what... I understood or anticipated. Yeah, sure. I didn't realize there was a B on that stamp. <laughs> so so while we're throwing that one in, I also had a gentleman in Japan who collects fishing, who bought the same stamp for the same reason, because there's a person with a fishing rod on the pier when you look very closely at the design. I did a stamp show here in California. I never, I never realized the, the passion that could uh, involve itself in, in, Topical collecting. Well, that's uh, why I was just mentioning it and because a, it's and sort a of a sideline. Comes up to my table, and there's a set of Tristan da Cunha uh, uh, B1 to four, priced at ten thousand dollars. He looks at it and says, "I'll take that." And I said, "That's great." Now I'm very happy to have the sale. And he says, "Yeah, I collect fish on stamps." I said, Jesus Christ, there's gold in them bar hills. <laughs> that really that, that 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 really shook me to my foundations because I'd never thought a whole lot about topical collecting. But it's very important. I've got some wonderful topical clients. And as you say, uh, you may not have even known there was a B on that stand. I didn't know there was a B. <laughs> no, I pass it on. You may be able to get another sale, but I doubt it. And and the same with the Victorian <laughs> butterfly cancels that you mentioned. I mean, I've often sold those to butterfly collectors because they're not 
in any way aware of them existing. And uh, oh, yeah. the moment you I bring it to charming. their attention, really they get excited. Them. Yeah, yes. And you get the the red uh, reply paid ones too, which is always pretty because you can get them in different colors. Well, sure. I mean, it, it's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of charm in philately. And you know, it's kept us, it's kept you and I happy for decades. And, and it's great for the mental to learn. Of... Yep, totally agree. It's well, good to see you. you. See you in London or the next international, Tony. Okay, mate. All the best. Thanks so much for calling. Really, this is a nice surprise. Thank you, George. Lovely to see you. All you, the best. You, you okay. take, take care. Cheers. And great advice. Mark Boyce, have you got a question? I don't have a question, but just a comment for George. I met you in 1981 at Rompex, and okay. you spent considerable time with me on my GB collection, and I've always remembered that. And it was very inspirational and gave me a lot of insight. I was just beginning my GB collection at that time, and you gave me a lot of insight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I especially remember some of our discussions about the the uh, official overprints that have oh, been yeah. such a terrible thing in in the you know there's so many forgeries of those overprints. Oh, it's true. been been a real uh, that's what the uh, that's what the certificates for. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I'm, del I'm delighted. At... It's fun as a dealer who spent his life both as a collector and as, a, as an active dealer. It is. It's fun to talk to people at stamp shows and sit down and see what they're trying to do. Find out what in the world is there that I can give him a hand with. What's going to make? What's going to bring him more pleasure and more joy from the formation of that collection? If I mm -hmm. if I take an interest in trying to do it, so for that it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a great it's it's a great pleasure to work for my clients. How big they are is irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. From a hundred dollars a month to Tens of thousands doesn't matter, but, but thank the you, fun George. is yeah. is you get. I hate to say it, but I get terribly involved in some of these collections, and they're not my collection. In fact, a good friend of mine has sold a had a wonderful 19th century collection world, and I don't know. The bur, he got a burr up his tail, and he dumped the collection in an auction, and I saw it was coming up and his name attached. And I called him up and I said, "You're selling our collection." <laughs> <laughs> it may have been his money, but it was an awful lot of my blood, sweat, and tears went into forming that collection. And I was frankly pissed <laughs> because I had a lot of energy and time and effort into helping him build this wonderful collection. And to see him just dump it into a sale oh, drove me crazy because I'd gotten, unfortunately, I'd gotten, I'd gotten involved in it and was enjoy I didn't collect it, so I collected it through him. And helped him work on his 19th century collection. So it, uh, I, I thank you for your for your input. And uh, if I can be of help to you ever, I'm there. Thanks, George. No, All right, no. Tony. Tony Plum, uh, you need to turn on your. You're you're muted right now. Yeah, there I'm we go. Through. I hope now. Uh, very good to see you, George. Oh, um, you, sir. And and it's a, a fairly broad question. I wondered if I could uh, prompt you to say what were the best emerging trends and what were the worst emerging trends you saw in current philately? Uh, I am an antique dealer. My stock stopped in 1935, unless you said I got to have something from 1952, in which case I will somehow make it happen. But our stock books, the stock books, you, the 50, 25 pound stock books you see behind me stop in 1935. That whole thing is just early colonial material mints and used by Scott and Gibbons numbers for wantless. So I can give the guy the single stamp he needs. It may be $4.18 or 4815 It doesn't matter. What matters is it's set up to be user friendly by you for you and all the other people listening to this thing because it will help them get what they want to do. Most dealers do not want to break a five hundred dollar set to sell you a twelve dollar stamp. Yeah, but it's, it happens to be the twelve dollars happens, happens to be what you want. It's not my. It's not your fault. Not my fault. It's what you need. The dealer is supposed to be taking care of the needs of his clients. The client is supposed to write the check and say thank you very much for helping me. 
and then we have a meeting of the minds. But go back. Trends. Um, well, I, there's nothing trendy about my business. I'm an intact dealer. <laughs> so the, the stuff I've done was 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 great 100 years ago. It's still great today. Um, I don't follow, I, I have to say I follow individuals and their interest levels and tre trended tendencies in the marketplace mean absolutely nothing to me because I'm here to work specifically one on one with you and your collection of whatever it is. Uh, trends, the the, uh, the the biggest trend we've seen in, in recent times is the is the proliferation of, of grading U.S. stamps, uh, which I think is a I'm not I'm not thrilled with it. It's a it's a uh, it's a it's a factor, but um, I mean that doesn't have anything to do with philately per se. It's it's a judgment call on something that somebody else produced, and it is whatever they want to discuss it with. Uh, if there's trends, if there's modern trends, I'm not aware of them because I deal with people who largely collect uh, classic Europe, classic South America, classic uh, early. I love early, early material. I've always espoused that. So I'm, I'm deeply mired in the 19th century and early 20th century and uh, not terribly au courant with things after World War II. But I will always try to... <laughs> <laughs> showing sending me a want this is like <laughs> like waving a red flag to a bull <laughs> i have no sales resistance to a want list i will try and see if i can't make something happen with that thing as long as they keep it within the within the period that that uh, is is uh, uh, relates to victoria edward and george of mm -hmm. the empire or has foreign things that they're trying to do something with. um Trends? Uh, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm more in Scottish classic philately, and I'm probably not the right person to ask that question to because there are people who are living in the present to a greater degree than I am. Okay. Well, right. I, I did what I could for. I'm sorry. Jim Gerson, do you have a question? Yeah, <clears throat> yes. And I apologize. I can't figure out how to get my picture up on this thing. Well, it's, it's Jim Gerson from Florida, I assume. Well, Jim Gerson from Florida, now Denver. Well, Jim, you rascal, you, how are you? Same guy. I'm terrific. Oh, <laughs> I can't say how much fun and pleasure I had working with you for many, many years on the building of your wonderful collection. Uh, I agree, and I hope I wasn't the guy you were referring to who built this wonderful collection and then dumped it on the- No, 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 no. Because no, no, no. I did that also. This is another, that also. Yeah, but that's not the point. We had, we had a boatload of fun, and I promise you I put my heart and soul into that collection. <clears throat> Absolutely. And you're, because I, you were always a gracious, person to work with well thank you that meant so much to me because uh, that the worst thing you can possibly do jim is to encourage me if you do that we're all in deep doo-doo <laughs> <laughs> well i hope you enjoy the stuff that you bought at my auction absolutely i gave you great support <laughs> and you were able to get a bunch of it back which was nice. oh absolutely i certainly did i was a very good supporter uh <laughs> But we, I think we had a lot of fun together over many years. And uh, I like to think I did a, a very creditable job for you in helping you build it because it was a lovely, lovely collection. I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, you did. And, and something you said, which I found very important, that most dealers will not do. If you get to a point where you're, where you're almost on the verge of finishing a country and you got one or two openings, and they happen to sit inside a set, you were willing to break that free. Absolutely. Like a lot of dealers. Won't For you that. and the rest of the guys, this yeah. is this, this is not, you're that's the that's, ones that need the help. That's, that's, a, that's, that's my a, whole reason to exist is to take care of what the needs of the client. 
Is it a pain in the you know what to break a set and then screw around trying to fill it in again? Yeah, but I made the customer wildly happy. Yes. And, and I thank that you to me that. was much more important than the aggravation of trying to screw around with a broken set. Yes, and I thank you for that. You're very, very welcome. You were very good. You were a joy, an absolute joy to work with. What a nice surprise. God, I don't know who I don't know who's out there. <laughs> George, um, we had an anonymous question about New Zealand OPSO overprints. Are you familiar with those? It's the Pope from Argentina. Yes, I'm very familiar with them. Um, they're wondering about rarity, valuation, opinions, et cetera. I have, uh, they're my favorite issue uh, of Australia because they appear on loads of people's lawn lists. Um, we had a collector here uh, in Southern California who had the biggest collection of those that I have ever encountered anywhere in the world. He had well over a hundred opsos, including two, two shillings, which are giant rarities. And he, he ended up coming to auction and I bought 90% of the offering because it was a chance of a lifetime to put a stock of things together that are on virtually everybody's want list. And they're woefully under cataloged, in my opinion. Mm. But I put my money where my mouth is and I bought a great deal of it over the years. I probably handle as much opso material as any dealer alive. I think they're they're a key issue. They're a key thing. I mean, New Zealand number one's a great stamp, and two's a great stamp, and three's a great stamp. Galloping tens of thousands of dollars, but they exist 150, 100, 150 copies. Try and put the opsos together, and you'll find out what a real challenge is all about. They are very, very difficult. They make some of the, the so-called bigger stamps in New Zealand look pretty silly by comparison. Uh, your anonymous, your anonymous uh, uh, inquiry. Shame I can't hear this. I feel strongly about it. And I have supported that market as few people have. I'm trying to listen to this and I have. can't hear it. And it's all about New Zealand. I'm sorry, what? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Ray, we could hear you, so it must be your volume. Mm. Ray, could you hear us now? All right, George, I know you only gave us 25 minutes, but if you could hang out a little bit. You can have whatever you want. I'm here for you. You'll tell me when I'm done. Well, there's I'm a done great, when you say I'm done. Well, there's a great mix of like dealers and collectors here. And That's fine. Take them one at a time. I'll, I'll, I'll field whatever you've got. Tony, welcome. Uh, welcome. Um, T. George, do you notice that um, the, the modern postal authorities are doing their best to kill the stamp collector? Depends upon how you want to, you how you want to. I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, uh, Liechtenstein and Monaco <laughs> existed for a hundred years on the basis of, of a plethora of beautiful uh, colored stamps. You don't have, to, the lovely thing about philately is you collect what you want. You collect the countries you want, you collect the issues you want. My British Africa stops in 1935. Now, how much Georgia 6 and QE2 came after that? Tons of it. Do I care? No, because it's all wallpaper and discount postage as far as I'm concerned, except the few rarities, of which there are very few. The things that are difficult and challenging are in George V and Edward and, and the Queen Victoria. They captured my attention for a lifetime. What they issue in Basutaland next year as, as a souvenir sheet on the first, first flight to the moon uh, has, <laughs> is of no consequence, thank you, is of no consequence to me because I wouldn't buy them if they were given to me. You don't have to collect new issues. You collect, the lovely thing about philately is you collect the countries you like, you collect the issues you like. 
I try to put a corral around. I don't want, my father did Eastern and Western Europe for, until he died. And that was about, so he was on new issue service. But when he finally passed, which was uh, two, about 2000, I stopped the new issues. And I said, I don't care. I did this in honor of my father. He's no longer here. And I poured considerable amounts of money into rarities of these countries. The rare early, the material of substance from Austria, from Belgium, from Switzerland. I went after the most important things, the scarcest things that my allowance would allow me to, to deal with. And we all have a budget including my little retired postman with his hundred dollars a month bless his heart he had it for years but so he's able to continue collecting because i made it possible for him to do it in a way that didn't disturb his his uh his retirement and i love doing it it makes me it made me feel good to do it, it had nothing to do with the money what do you collect me uh basically just new zealand well, New Zealand has a lot of a lot of great stuff, but I I I have a uh, how many opsos do you have? None. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. <laughs> the thing that always amazes You're going me. to have to define that for the non-New Zealand collectors. Yeah. Well, I with do. The, with the um, the thing that always amazed me with those is the the ones with the um, the initial written as um, in red ink, and I'm, it always amazed me as to the actual. I don't believe that when they are writing official on some of the stamps, uh, as opposed to the OPSO ones. But the I just don't believe that any any postal clerk or policeman, as the case may have been for the the ones with official written on them, they nobody had ink like that to write on the stamps. Well, the op opsos, as you know, are hand stamps, not handwritten. But I'm thinking, but the ones that the the official ones that are over. Well, that's that are, a different story. That the 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 Reef, Reefton. You talk about the Reefton provisionals. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, that's a different story. That's not that's, that has nothing to do with the opsos. I don't, I don't have any of those either. Well, no, I don't. Yeah, join the club. But no, <laughs> I've handled. I've handled. I have probably handled with certificates. I probably handled a good two hundred opsos in my lifetime because I love them because they are so rare. The the catalog values are so somewhat parsimonious based on what's available. You try to build one with an open checkbook and you're still in deep doo-doo because there just isn't enough of it to show up. And I built some staggering collections of that stuff, but these people played the game. And mm -hmm. they wrote checks for five and 10 and 20 and $30,000 for pieces that were important because mm -hmm. they don't show up. Mm -hmm. No, I consider in, in a general in a general fashion, uh, I consider them to be the most challenging large issue in New Zealand by a long shot. Uh, you, before we get to you, Frederick, that's this sort of goes along with exactly what you were saying about how doing the collection on the budget. So this is really, I think it's really sound advice. Well, and, it's, it's, uh, it, we need to get a feeling for, for the countries we're collecting. New right. Zealand's a very lovely country, um, uh, but has some extremely rare things uh, in the in the in the initial issues. But I've always had a you 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 picked the one thing that I have a very great strong feeling about, and that's the opsos because they are very very difficult. Okay. It's been very hard to keep any kind of a stock, even at many multiples of Stanley Gibbons or or whatever catalog you want to use. Okay. There isn't very much of it around. It's very hard to build a collection of it when the material isn't. Even if you're willing to pay the price, doesn't help when nobody's got a two shilling 
I don't think there's a two shilling on a stock anywhere in the world right now at any price. I've got three or four clients that have them, but that's because they came from me. When I had them, they went directly to these people because they were dyed the wool aficionados of the subject. Well, now we you're in some... something an interest in common. George, you're in for some fact checking because we have you, Jeffries, up there. <laughs> oh, well, <Question>. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you. It's perfectly Welcome. okay. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. Greetings and salutations. <laughs> oh. Hold on. There you go, you. I think you're unmuted. Okay. Yep. Right. Hi, George. How are you doing, pal? Uh, Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. Nice new catalog you came out with. Oh <laughs> uh, well, that's very nice of you to say so. Um, well, it's always fun to see what you what you what you come up with. <laughs> and somehow there's always things out there that neither one of us had any idea existed. Absolutely true. And Absolutely suddenly it true. comes out of nowhere, and you say, "Jesus Christ, I didn't realize that." <laughs> well, there's people out there who know stuff that that you and I know. knows, and you know sometimes we're just journeyman kind of, stamp dealers yeah they're kind enough to tell us and uh we can tell the rest of the world well but you have you have a secret ingredient you 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 have the secret ingredient, the best and most most important secret ingredient in the world uh which is specifically uh well <laughs> who works who who works for you part time now when he used to work uh -huh. full time? <laughs> right. Well, yes, that 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 secret ingredient. That's the best. He's got the best overall knowledge of British Commonwealth of anybody in the world. His 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 skill levels in that are non parallel, as they say. I have always had the deepest respect for him. Well, and his, his, very, his un, very, unrivaled, very, uh, his unrivaled understanding of the subjects. We're very fortunate to have him. Yes. Uh, I said to him, if, if he ever dies, I said, I'd sell my stock in Stanley Gibbons because I said, you're the biggest asset that company's got, period. <laughs> and I said that to him years in, in front of him and behind his back. <laughs> He knows very much how how I how strongly I feel about his him and his accomplishments as a as a uh, 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 as a philatelist. Uh, he's had okay. unbridled opportunities sitting on the BPA committee for so many years to okay. see such a plethora of wonderful material, handle it, jump up and down on it, play with it, and work with it. There's no substitute for such things. Okay, we're in a group, so you do have to mention who the he is. Philip Kins. Okay. There's no question about who. <laughs> There's no question about who we're talking about. <laughs> okay, George, I, I'm sweetheart. probably going to regret this, hmm? but uh, you have hinted once or twice this evening um, uh, about catalogs not being um, quite as accurate as they might be. So I'm going to ask as you at the people who who understand the issue. Uh, if they understand yeah. the issues, I got no problem with it. But when the number doesn't seem to to, to work appropriately, uh, it doesn't jive. So this is a problem I've had with Philip for 50 years. I love him dearly, always will, and always respect him. But commercially, we never ever saw eye to eye about anything really relevant, relevant to this. It's uh, case in point, I do, and, and just, just just for the fun of it, um, a major, a major London stamp dealer who will go unmentioned. You're going to be in trouble with Joan. Doesn't matter. Bottom bottom. The bottom bottom line is. The stamp catalog's 25,000 pounds. A meaty stamp. Way too cheap, but never mind. Still, 25,000 pounds. Stamp comes up to sale. I go to the sale. I jump, I don't know, 300,000 pounds on the afternoon. It was a very important section of stuff. 
from one of my favorite subjects, which is Zanzibar. <laughs> All right, Calix, 25,000 pounds. Um, they're there to buy it almost certainly for a client. So we, we duke it out and they drop out at 75,000 and I buy it. No, it's fine. So Calix, 25. Um, the next year, Gibbons revalues it from 25000 to 45000 I said to myself, how can this be? They themselves dropped at 70 plus 20. They dropped at the equivalent of 85,000 pounds. And yet the catalog shows a, a, an increase of 45000 which doesn't relate to anything relating to the stamp. George, you're going to have to stay still because you're moving out of your frame. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. We just, you know, I wasn't sure if that was tap dancing or. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm new at this. <laughs> no, I know you are. I know you are. That's why I didn't want you to, you know, just say, you know, George Holshower that, you know, keeps popping in and out. But well, that's great. Am I, am I in again? Yes. You're oh, in again. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. It's just, you know, I. No, look, um, give me back to Stanley Gibbons. <laughs> yeah, so my, my my question was, what advice would you give to a catalog editor, any catalog editor, on improving the accuracy of his catalog? Oh, look, I think you do a wonderful job. I think it is, you know, it's the best catalog in the world relevant to British colony. That I don't agree with everything is neither. He doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I don't respect you. It doesn't mean I don't understand how much effort you go through to try and do what it is you do. But nobody can be nobody can be on top of everything. I would sit down with the people who spent 20, 30, 50, 60, 70 years playing with some of these issues now that that may or may not have any relationship to uh, the current thinking does not alter the experience which can't be replicated whatever they have to say there's something to it <laughs> or they wouldn't do it that's why i uh, somebody in one of the offices on the strand said well there's this guy in california he actually occasionally sells to us for more than our prices I said, well, if I didn't believe in them, I wouldn't support it the way I do. No, look, it, it, it it's an ungracious job. You try to be everything to everybody. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I certainly respect what you're doing. And the last thing I want to do is, is, uh, is hurt you in any way, shape or form. Because Stanley Gibbons is the bellwether of the, of the colonial stamp market. And we need you out there in a healthy state to lead our marketplace and the rest of us will follow behind you far behind you but we'll we'll still follow uh, let's do lunch in london sometime and we can we can talk uh, off the record <laughs> yeah, this I'm is okay. happy to do that let's do that oh please that's uh, that's the dinner or lunch so It'll george i just wanted to mention that we had the asda eric you're with the jackson you're with the asda they were kind enough to send out a notice about your talk, as did the PTS posted something. Uh, oh, and really? The, and the Canadian Stamp Dealers Association. Oh, well, I didn't think anybody would listen to this thing. So, so I was like, all right, does, you know, you know, anyway. So you, I guess you're very well loved. And Eric, thank you very, thank you guys very, very much for doing that. Hey, who am I talking to now? <laughs> Eric Jackson. He's the oh, ASPA. Okay. Well, I got pictures at the top of my. And if there's anyone here from the PTS or the Canadian Stamp Dealers or NSDA, please chime in because the London conversation is definitely up for grabs because I come over often enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'll be happy to, to tell you what motivates the thought processes behind what I'm doing. One of your bosom buddies said to me, oh, the prices he pays are unsupportable. <laughs> well, I've been supporting them handily for 50 years. 
and the value of the stuff has changed dramatically, which it should because it's, it's some, some stuff is wildly rare and wildly uh, a bit a bit a bit conservative. Uh, but I said, as long as there's someone willing to to to, we need galvanization in that market, and the the movement is, in my opinion, a little too slow, too conservative. You could do an awful lot more with. Let's talk in London. <laughs> I promise you, I'm happy to talk to you. Leon. Okay, here we are. What? Uh, what? Uh, who do I get to talk to now? <laughs> are we done or what? Well, Rob, there's a question in the Q and A, isn't there? About um, um not the Q and A, maybe the chat. There's been questions about Heligoland as to why oh. it's it's unpopular. It's not unpopular. There's a lot of devoted people who do it, but it is the problem with Helgoland is the enormous number of forgeries and the yeah. enormous number of reprints. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with that stuff at all. Uh, I want Bundesproofer certificates from Germany on this stuff because it's it's pretty treacherous. I wouldn't say it's unpopular. Everybody, everybody who collects German states has a collection of Helgoland, whether they're genuine or reprints remains to be seen. I'm not the I'm not the guy to ask about that because I don't have that kind of specialized understanding. And I'm going to defer to people who know the subject much better than I do. Okay. So that's what I can say. That's all I can say about Helgoland. <laughs> Give it back to the Indians. <laughs> Okay. A tough subject. <laughs> I'm glad I edit these before I put them up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You can probably go get into trouble. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm speaking extemporaneously and not from a prepared script. So I'm shooting I'm shooting from the hip. <laughs> Couldn't tell. Tony. <laughs> uh, yes. George. Particularly for your period up to 1935, what do you think about the general trend of collectors having to have mint unhinged? Um, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that. Um, you know, we're talking about the stamp that's got the, you know, 27 layers of hinge on the back, but I'm talking. You know, just a, you know, just a, an action light hinge why I, why I am playing? not enough I am not personally enough I have 120 volumes of material from many different countries and some of us if never hinged I'm not going to put I'm not going to hinge it I'll put it in the mount the fact mm -hmm. of the matter is is it is a proclivity brought about largely out of Europe after the in the 1950s and caught on to some extent I <laughs> I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot if you want never hinge that will supply it never hinge at a price you, but you better sit down before you write the check because this is this is pain especially the early material it is wildly painful stuff worth two or three times anybody's catalog <laughs> because it's too hard to do um if they like it bless their hearts i personally am not enamored of it uh, if I try to collect what I put together in unmounted condition, uh, my collection would be about 5% as big as it is now. And the 95% would have gone to pay for the never hinged stuff, which was, I think it's preposterous. But uh, uh, if my if my folks want it, my folks run this. They tell me what they want to do and how they want to do it. I am not here to argue with anybody. Tell me well, what you want. Speaking of not arguing, Paul, I want Paul. Is that a future stamp collector there, Paul Holland? I hope so. But right now, <laughs> it's po Pokemon cards. What? Yes, but what a cute young lady. Yeah. What a cute young lady. <laughs> yeah, we need all the cute young ladies we can get. <laughs> okay, Worth remember that editing. Is another one. <laughs> there you go. Whatever. I have a grandson as well, who's three. So all right. Well, you guys hope. <laughs> my my son isn't married yet, so I, I I'm hoping for some grandchildren eventually. 
George, David Sachs was asking, uh, what about forgeries? Do you work with them at all? Well, I try <laughs> to keep them out of my stock. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I keep, I keep, <laughs> forgeries I keep, I keep as a, as a reference when I have them. The fact is I'm, that's why we build not so much forgery collections, but reference collections of material that's authentic and real. So I've got something to compare. Um, I've got something to compare the material in question with. I, I certainly don't collect them per se, but but they're they're a in certain areas they're they're an important part of what we do. And Sparati is frightful. Frightful. <laughs> yeah, I love the forged Sparatis, right? The forgeries of the forgeries. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, when you have to pay five hundred dollars for a fifty dollars stamp because it's a Sparati, then suddenly the Sparati becomes more <laughs> valuable than the stamp. What is that about David Donald Evans, David? Okay. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. he's complaining about people who put forgeries on extension. What's forgeries on extension? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's a bit bizarre, but I mean, yeah, you see forgeries. Sure Occasionally, forgeries are, are worth a whole hell of a lot more than the original stamp. Yeah. So you can either collect them or not collect them. I mean, it, it is, the whole hobby is what makes us happy, what gives us joy, what we enjoy putting together, and most important, the challenge of the time, to go out there and try and find this stuff and put it together. My father said, Country X has 100 stamps, and 99 stamps is very nice, but it's not finished until you have 100 different stamps. And unfortunately, I bit on that prospect, and I won't quit a country until I have 100 out of 100. Or in the case of Russia, 8,000 out of 8,000. It's not finished till that last stamp is in there. So <laughs> I'm a slave to my own, <laughs> my own problems. But that's why I understand the needs of my clients as well as I do, because I'm not just the hair club president for men. I use the product <laughs> big time. <laughs> so here we are. Well, hi, Sandra. Welcome. You know, thank you all. Is there any other questions for George or are we going to let him get back to work? Well, I'm here. <clears throat> I'm here to help. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks for taking all this all this time. Well, it's perfectly it's okay. It, it's 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 fun to to meet the people, some of whom I actually knew, uh, and uh, talk about the nature of what we do. This has made us all very very happy over many many years. The satisfaction is immense. We all know it. We all understand it, and we all get joy from it. And we only go around once, and if we do it right, once is enough. Right. All right. <laughs> Now, who's that that prepossessing young lad <laughs> who bears a strong resemblance to a revenue dealer? <laughs> you know, I, I read that a similar comment in Forbes magazine probably 50 years ago. It said, you only live once. If you do it right, that's all you need. That's right. How are you? <laughs> I'm surprised even friends of mine tuned in. <laughs> I knew I'd get some laughs out of it. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking at the the premier American revenue dealer <laughs> of all time. <laughs> so. We got him in a British Empire study group talk. Well, we won't he let was that going get somewhere out. else. <laughs> he was going to the revenue discussion and ended up ended up in front of the ended up in front of the, the, the british colony folks <laughs> oh george i've known you forever yes you have <laughs> we're, we're good friends yep and it, this is a very nice part of the whole business yep. is the relationships that we build 
And it's it's very sorry. It, it is very sorry to see that thing tighten up a bit, especially of late. Um, but I think we can both say that we were blessed to have found something that has brought us so much joy and so much pleasure every single day. Do I go into the office on Saturday and on Sunday? Yeah, if I feel like it, absolutely. The people have to be taken care of. They need something. They, right. they, came to us to, they came to you to help you with the revenues. They came to me to help them with their foreign or their British colonies. I have a responsibility to these people to take care of their needs. <laughs> I feel that very strongly, very, very strongly. That's why I'm in business, to take care of their needs. That's right. And I'm you always are, running behind. Yeah, well, that's true, too. <laughs> but we get a lot of joy out of it. Absolutely. Occasionally, we even make a buck or two, which is, that's also nice. But it, it's long since ceased to be the, the single motivating factor where mm -hmm. we, the joy we get out of it is, is enormous. <laughs> that's the important thing. Oh, of course it is. To be able to laugh and, and enjoy what we're doing and feel like we made a difference on behalf of our clients. The, the, uh, that we helped them get to where they were trying to go. They came to us for help. When we're professional traders, we have somewhat of a reputation to uphold, <laughs> that we care about our clients and we care about what they're trying to do. And if they want our help, by God, they're gonna get it. That's right. And I'm, I'm sorry, I see, I, I'm sorry to sound so dogmatic, but that's how I feel right down to the tips of my toes. And just like any other good dealer such as yourself, that, that uh, there's, there's, it's, it's a joy. They got two chances of getting me to retire, slim and none. <laughs> and if I can't take the stance with me, I'm not going. <laughs> so there, harumph. <laughs> <laughs> two generations of this family worked on that collection i ain't leaving it behind <laughs> they'll have trouble finding it once i'm gone what the fuck are you doing to all you do with that collection <laughs> we had fun we had fun and we accomplished things it's been a very pleasant and very satisfying trip and it continues to be so and you just cannot put a price on the joy of, of what the, the joy and pleasure we get out of exercising all the various aspects of what it is we do. There's, it's priceless. It is absolutely priceless. And uh, I mean, that's how I feel about it. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Yep. That's, that's why people come to us because they say, hey, you know, this guy really cares. Well, sure, we care. These folks needed some help. We're supposed to be there to stand four square behind the clients and helping them accomplish what they set out to do. And occasionally we know the subject better than they do. So we can be of enormous help because we explain things to them that they don't realize because they didn't spend 50 years studying in or out of Zuzuland. <laughs> well, I have done, I have been, been 60 years studying in or out of Zuzuland. So I actually do understand the country pretty well. <laughs> it's learning, it's learning what the configuration is. And as in your U.S. revenues, you're able to, you're able to bring to the table 50 years plus or minus of understanding of the issue. And when you talk about something, and the guy says, well, gee, that's three times Scott. And you said, why don't you try and find another one? <laughs> that happens. Be a, be a sport. <clears throat> they need to understand what's difficult and what isn't difficult. And they, after 20 or 30 years, should know very well what their money can't do for them. Because money is not the panacea for everything. No, there are isn't. things I have never seen in a lifetime that I would die to get my hands on if I could ever find them. And I have tried enormous, enormous to accomplish some of that stuff. And still there are things that I am, am looking for. 
like try to finish my R1 to 102 perfectly centered with bang and bam stand cancel. <laughs> That's been the nastiest goddamn set I ever tried to finish. You know, I still need a couple pieces. I'm not happy with it. <laughs> and it's nonsense. Well, George, you may not be aware yet, but Siegel in December is going to be selling Brian Blackwin's first issue revenues. Yes, but Brian does blocks of four, and I want singles. Uh, he's got singles, too. It's the finest collection of first issue revenues ever formed. And the is quality. He, is he still with us? Spectacular. Yes, he is. I'm sorry. I understood he was very ill. Well, he has he has some health issues, but I, I just he called me today, and I spoke with him. And, well, when you say hello to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the problem is, my four cent playing card is superb. My rare twenty five dollars superb. My rare two hundred dollars superb. My rare uh, uh, what's the best one? The, 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 the no. six cent proprietary. Yeah. They're beautiful, beautiful. I I I do not want for anything else. It's mm -hmm. the other the other ten or twenty or thirty dollars stamps that I want in that condition. I can't find them. They're hard to find. <laughs> oh, you know, tell me about it. And that's been the hardest, silly thing I ever tried to do. <laughs> and it still isn't fit. It's mostly finished. Yep. But when I put the last perfect copy in there, I'll be a happy camper. It will have taken me 60 years. <laughs> and I mean, some of, some of these stamps catalog less than $100 because they're yes. really less than $100. Well, it's $50. What I wouldn't do to get my mitts on them. <laughs> I'm tired. Frankly, between us kids, I'm tired of looking. <laughs> I'd like to close that down. <laughs> George, Speaking you look one, like you're, George, you're going in and out again. You're traveling into another dimension. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you yeah. still see me? Or is it... Yeah, I don't know. You're a little blurry. So kind of a ghost. Why. But yeah, we don't want the ghost of George Wolshower. Uh, <laughs> the I'll come soon enough. <laughs> But um, all right, guys, it's almost eight o'clock here. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I know George, George is a great conversationalist, so I'm not going to close it down if anyone wants to. No, that's fine. I, I, whatever, whatever is, whatever floats your boat, whatever is necessary, I'm here to help and here to contribute the best I can to the subjects under discussion. Yeah, but I'll have to answer to Kevin in the morning, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, yeah, a great yeah. guy. I'm having, I'm having fun with it. Yeah. But uh, gee, I was really, it was fun to see some of my old pals show up yeah. out of nowhere. This I wasn't expecting. So. Thank so. you for, I mean, such a, a candid conversation. Like you, you said things that I wouldn't dare say, you know, but. I'm brave. Yeah, you're, and you're George. I, and I mean <laughs> what I say, or I wouldn't say it. <laughs> but you build strong feelings about things, and someone should have a good, strong opinion about things after this length of time, considering all the things they've looked at and done and worked with. And uh, uh, I think you get the rest of the boys from the from the the dealerships in here, and they will also be able to talk extemporaneously and strongly about the feelings that have developed over a lifetime in this in this uh, wondrous field of ours and it is it's, it's it's a joy absolute joy every day anyway is there any, anything else anything else you guys want to talk about i'm here <laughs> george do you have any plans to publish the um the hidden story behind africa collecting doing a book on it no actually i i i uh, that actually brings up something important and i'm glad you bring it up um philatelic literature is the biggest bargain in the world because uh i am not going to spend 60 years learning about the intricacies of inner outer zuzu land but general bull moose in pitcairn islands has done nothing but collect inner outer zuzu land for 60 years and suddenly 
For $119.95, he publishes a 75-page book spilling the beans about everything he learned in 60 or 70 years of, of fooling around with inner outer Zuzu land. Now, I may know something about inner, inner, out, inner outer Zuzu land, but I darn well don't know all the fine points that he's about to bring out. So for $119.95 to buy the book is a joy of monumental proportions because I read every book that I put in that library and I got a pretty sizable library because I thirst after knowledge and skill to increase my ability to be a more effective dealer on behalf of the needs of my clients. So and, why don't you write a book on the the Africa of your period? Well, I do the whole of Africa. So it's, it's, it's I uh, have lots of specialized books on various aspects of African philately. Well, you could add quite a bit to, to some of them. Well, you know, it's, it, it, uh, I suppose it's possible, but right now I'm up. I'm I'm so busy taking care of. I'm working six, seven days a week, feeling wantless and taking care of the business. Uh, uh, I haven't got time to, to turn around, and unfortunately, my wife passed away recently, so this has upset the the, the household uh, considerably. But uh, I I didn't give enough plugs to philatelic literature because that really is. That's a joy to sit down and find out what this guy discovered in 60 years of fooling around with inner outer tubaloo. A, <laughs> a joy a, worth every penny. I just got a I just got a book in from uh, Leonard Hartman is our great philatelic literature dealer in this country. I put in a plug for Leonard. He's a sweetheart <laughs> and yep. he's the best guy we've got right now. Anyway, he just sent me a book I ordered. Uh, uh, what was it? Oh. French and British uh, occupation of World War One Cameroons, which is a subject I'm very, very interested in, and that was a very nice book that came in, and I read it cover to cover because I want to learn more about, I want to learn more about, less and less until eventually I know everything about nothing, <laughs> I implode <laughs> upon myself. <laughs> so anyway, um, here we are. And hi to Richard Frigella who joined. Richard, God, I haven't seen Richard in years. Bless his heart. Where is he? You still can't uh, see here. him. He doesn't have uh, his video on. You could hear him. I don't have my video on. Is correct. Richard, you hear me? God, it's good. To, it's good to talk to you. Uh, it's been a, what? It's only been since nineteen seventy-two or something. Seventy-three. Oh sure. No, we go back to the year. We go back before the year one. <laughs> Oh, that's very, this is really nice. I really have, I don't know, I just haven't run into you at any of the shows or whatever, and it's just been a long, long time. No, I don't do shows much at all. I don't do shows, period, actually. But, uh, I, I loved your comments about recommending uh, dealer help mentoring collectors. Uh, people have an antagonistic view towards dealers, which is totally unwarranted in my opinion. Of course and it I is. And uh, I appreciate your comments. Well, that's true. You you have yeah. you have wonderful uh, understandings of areas that I don't. I have understandings of areas you don't. And some other guy knows something that neither one of us does. It's important for the collector to line up with the people who espouse his particular area of interest, whether it's your US area or my British mm -hmm. colony area, or somebody else's area of South America, it doesn't matter. No. They they will benefit, you and I know they will benefit greatly by the fact that we've stayed the course. We go back 50 years. We go back further than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe we're this old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. How the hell did this happen? <laughs> oh, time. Oh time. God! Yeah. Well, this is so heartwarming to see my pals show up. <laughs> and we have some, yeah, Matthew Cariga here. Or there's Ian Kimberly. There's a, yeah. A, oh, hey, oh, yeah, 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 friend here, from Canada. A very good Canadian dealer. Me listening in. <laughs> I think it would be interesting if if all of us were to write into to Scots and ask them to produce an album of Zuzuland. 
they'd, they'd find they find it difficult. They find it difficult to find pictures of the stamps to put in the album. <laughs> but we would refer them to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! Well, you got to have a mythological something to talk an every man country. <laughs> and so this this is one everybody can relate to inner outer zuzu land <laughs> that's terrific okay so should we let you well george you're out on the west coast so you don't have to i don't care i'm here to i'm here till the last dog is hung that's okay i have to feed keith but whatever i'm here I'm duncan here duncan hasn't said anything which is you know Unusual for Duncan. Well, you, you said you'd be censoring things, so, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I'm afraid they're going to have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to change the rating on mind. YouTube. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anything it's else? Amazing how we flip back and forth between America and New Zealand like that. It's incredible. I didn't realize the power of this thing. Yeah. Well, we have a great group here. Oh, Jason, jump in. You know, this is just a long shot, just in case. Um, did you ever encounter a um, Rhodesian dealer named Otto Petum? Oh. <laughs> Otto was a great character. Wasn't yes, he? I, yeah, I, I certainly, I certainly. Yeah, he's actually my uncle. I, I was very sad when he oh, passed. Oh, no, here. really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't COVID. know that. Yeah, it was just a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, we lost him. I was oh, very, very Otto, sad by it. He was, was like literally my favorite relative, and I, I don't have many relatives. I held him in very high it's esteem. Not, so. It's not unfair to say he was a great character. Oh, was he ever? And um, yeah, that was a sad one. <laughs> no, I had no it, idea. It was very sudden, too, because he was only like maybe 71, 72, and it was just like very sudden. Wasn't expected. Oh, really? Yeah. So. Oh, he's much younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at <laughs> but, uh, No, he was a great guy, and um, I have so many fond memories, and um, he taught me a lot about stamps. Um, I was well into stamp collecting long before um, I met him because, you know, he lived in the UK and south africa depending on what time of year it was and um i didn't meet him until it was, uh, was, was, was a probably wild, a teenager he was but, a wild you know. man <laughs> oh he sure was <laughs> he, 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 I, I know exactly what we're talking about. about the same guy <laughs> uh, oh we definitely are as soon as he's as soon as he's reacted like that i knew that the answer was yes <laughs> <laughs> of course well, all right thanks for that no no <laughs> certainly <laughs> Ah, uh, it's a great life if you don't weaken," <laughs> said Mother. <laughs> yeah, he lived. Uh, he lived a full one. Oh, he sure did. Okay, Sarandra, so you look like you're tired there. No, I'm fine. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Line him up in the other alley. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to try and help you with the, with the synchron. As best you can. Uh, these guys take care of themselves. They're they're each one of them are very talented and oh, absolutely. The knowledge. Absolutely. And Duncan's our my fact checker. He'll tell me everything. You Bob Bob Lippert, of course. Oh yes. And and his partner Rademacher. Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. They, and uh, uh, as I say, I worked for Peter Kennedy almost ten years great great opportunity to learn material that i didn't have any particular facility with but by the time i got done i knew an awful lot about things i never did much with again but I, at least i had an opportunity to, to have the experience and roger roger we were talking about roger kerber and right. kennedy would send me over to cornfield every year because i was going to go anyway he said, if you see something that you think we can make some money with, buy it. So I would buy collections and lots of things for, for him and buy a bunch of stuff for myself. And Roger would go over and we'd sit together at the, at the sale. Shoot. 
It's Ingo here from Canada. Hi, Ingo. Ingo, how you doing? Doing great. George, uh, you may recall I was the guy who helped you get through customs for Capex. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. I do um, appreciate that. I think I figured out what um, Zuzuland is. It's got to <laughs> be it's got to be Tanu Tuva. Oh, oh no, no, that's it's Tuna Tava. It's Tuna Tava, <laughs> which is Tuna Tuva spelled backwards. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> hey, we got to have some mythological place to play around with. So, in or out of Zuzu Land is my creation. I planted my flag there. <laughs> I'm still looking for a cover from Hong Kong to Tanutuva. Well, I mean that that can't be. I've never seen such a thing, but it can't be. It can't be un, totally unrealistic either. Uh, there's always hope. Yeah, hope springs infernal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'm totally enjoying this. I keep saying, okay, I got to get off and I can't stop listening to you. your enthusiasm is just bubbling through. Oh, I can't help it. This is how you, what you get is what I am. 100%. I, I can't censor this. <laughs> it's how I feel. Great to see you, man. Good to see you too, pal. Michael Dixon isn't here to talk about uh, Upper Bonga Land, uh, though. <laughs> Hunka Bunga Land. Okay, <laughs> it's his turn. I got mine. Mine is in or out of Zuzu Land. <laughs> so, what's happening at your end of the swamp? My end of the swamp. Yep. Uh, still looking for some modern covers. There are 133 values of decimal nations, and I think I've got 120 of them. Oh my word, that's a very. I mean, I can. I. I. I don't go near. That seems like a very complicated subject. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. I just. I don't. Un, I don't begin. Well, of course, it's way, way, way after the areas that I built a position in. But it, from what I can see, it seems like a pretty complicated subject. Uh, yes, we have, most mason collectors only do part of it. I mean, how many stamps must there be in a, 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 to have everything or pretty well everything? Thousands? Uh, yeah. If you had everything in Degum, you'd have a, it, it's, it's, it's many, many thousands. Oh, well. I think, um, I think someone said there were 155 varieties of the half penny. Oh, my God. That's so funny. funny. I give up. I think <laughs> that's before I start. <laughs> that includes more level of detail than I'm interested in. Yeah, I don't blame you. I was uh, always... enough, uh, with 150 some odd volumes. I I I have plenty of challenges left. Mm. I don't need to take on anything new. <laughs> right. I've had enough fun for one lifetime. <laughs> Do you remember Marty Raskin? East and uh, not Eastland stamps. The other other he had to. The, the stamp shop and auction on the other part of, at the other part of town. Marty Raskin. Uh, no. Oh. No. Well, I remember the Eastland stamp auctions, though. I went to all of them. Oh, yeah. Well, I wrote up a lot of that. <laughs> wow. No, that was. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, well, there was a lot of interesting stuff to be mind out of there okay. all right anything else or should we let uh, let george go and, and i'll go and i'll go keith is getting cranky so <laughs> um, george, george you know how keith gets yeah <laughs> thank you I'm here. i, I want to make sure i gave a hundred percent oh you are fantastic i mean this is this is really great i mean yeah, wait till you edit it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's going to end up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Well, I think we had some fun. We covered some ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, uh, and it's great I, advice. I, yeah. I, I hope I answered most of the questions the best I could. You did. 
Well, like I really I said, appreciate you sharing your expertise with us, George. Okay. Anything else for George? Or should we all say good night or good morning or wherever? Yeah. Good night, everybody. Okay. Wherever. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Okay. Hey, Thank good night, you, George. Man. Thanks so good much, night. folks, for allowing me the pleasure of <laughs> venting my. my <laughs> Thank I saw them on the stamp on the stamp market, but uh, Thank you, George, I really appreciate the yeah. opportunity you gave me to to do this piece. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right Great on. show, George. Bye, bye, folks. Good night.